It's my distinguished honor and pleasure to be able to introduce our luncheon keynote speaker. Ed Emmett is a professor in the practice at Rice University with a focus on public policy. In addition, he is a senior fellow at Rice University's Kinder Institute for Urban Research and a fellow at Rice University's Door Institute for New Leaders. In addition to his duties at Rice, he is also the owner of the Emmett Company, a consulting firm advising public and private entities in transportation policy, emergency management, international marketing, and strategic development. It, from 2007 until 2019, um, Ed Emmett served as the judge, the county judge of Harris County. In this position, Emmett was also the director of Homeland Security and Emergency Management, a role which established him as a national leader in emergency response and community resilience. Mr. Emmett was also a member of the Texas House of Representatives from 1979 to 1987, and during this time served as chairman of the Committee on Energy, a member of the Transportation Committee, and represented the state on numerous national committees relating to energy and transportation policy. In 1989, President George H.W. Bush nominated Ed Emmett as a commissioner at the Interstate Commerce Commission. After being confirmed unanimously by the United States Senate, Emmett served on the commission for three years. He has received international recognition for his work in transportation and logistics policy, and was also named the Transportation Person of the Year by Transportation Clubs International and one of the top 20 logistics professionals by the Logistics Forum. Uh, Ed Emmett is a, is a Houston area native, having attended Bel Air High School, and he graduated from here at Rice in 1971 with a bachelor's in economics, and from the University of Texas at Austin in 1974 with a master's in public affairs. And so with that, let's give a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Ed Emmett. Well, thank you very much. Um, this is going to be more of a conversation than a lecture. And by all means, keep eating, because I know you will anyway. <laughs> I'm very used to it as the father of four and the grandfather of 13. I'm used to sitting at a table talking while everybody else eats. So, <laughs> you know, I, I understand that uh, Mark Jones was not able to, to be here this morning due to illness. And so uh, I'm going to cover some of what he was supposed to say. I think I've got a little bit of background to do that. Uh, but maybe even more appropriate, if you're talking about policy making in Texas, inspired or depressing. It's a messy topic, and, and maybe this morning's session about, you know, erupting volcanoes, earthquakes, and landslides is more appropriate uh, to follow. But we're supposed to talk about 50 years from now. You know, what's policy going to look like in the state of Texas? And so that's why it's not an easy thing to just sort of go down a path. So I'm just going to share some thoughts that hopefully won't be random. I think they're in, in some kind of an order. But in order to think about 50 years from now, you've got to think about 50 years in the past. <clears throat> and when I, now that I'm a professor here at Rice, which I enjoy a great deal, and people do make fun of the fact I'm the oldest living president of Lovett College. That's, that's when you know you've been here a long time. Uh, but if you look back 50 years, you have to talk about the politics of 50 years ago. There were two parties in Texas. There were liberal Democrats and conservative Democrats. <laughs> no, absolutely true. And they fought each other much more, well, maybe not more, but certainly as much as the Republicans and Democrats do today. And if you realize that policy making, like it or not, is a result of politics, then you have to understand the politics that have gone on and that are still going on. Politics are always messy. They have results that you don't always count on. I'm living proof of that. <clears throat> you know, it's always been described that, that watching laws be made is similar to watching sausage be made. 
and there's truth to that. But what you have to understand about politics, from my point of view anyway, is that politics aren't dictated by ordinary people. Politics are dictated by the activist, the people who choose to get involved. And, and I don't mean just go vote. I mean the people who actually get involved in the political parties, whichever they are. And by the way, I'm, I will probably make, if you're a Democrat, I will make you mad. If you're a Republican, I will make you mad. I'm gonna be equal today because you have to look at what's going on. And when I say it's dictated by activists, what's that, what that has given us in recent years anyway is two political parties who are, who are dominated by the extremes. And centrist, whether you're left of center or right of center, anywhere near the center, you're not in that process. Why do I say that? Well, let's talk about primary elections. So few people vote in either primary regularly. I mean, this year you had a little bit of an unusual circumstance, or in 2008 when Barack Obama was running, you had a much larger turnout in the Democratic primary than you would normally have. But to put it in perspective, if you go back before the early 1970s, 50 years ago, there were many years where more people voted in the Democratic primary in Texas than voted in the general election because it was assumed that whoever the Democrat nominee was, was gonna win. So the big fight was in the Democratic primary. Can you imagine that today? I mean, today we have five or 6% vote in the Republican primary and a, a similar number in the Democratic primary. So it really means that 10 to 12% of the voters are choosing the nominees, and that's what you're stuck with in November. And then people go, well, we don't like any of these candidates. Well. But that's the way the primaries work. Then you get into the question of what are the hot issues <clears throat> versus the actual needs. People tend to vote on hot issues. They, they, don't, uh, they don't sit back and think, well, we really need a well-reasoned, comprehensive plan for how to approach this, 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 or this. Instead, whatever the issue of the day is, that's what's gonna get their attention. But how did we get from this two Democratic Party state to where we are now with Democrats having been out of power statewide since, uh, what, 94? It's a long time. Particularly when you realize that 1978, which was only 40 years ago roughly, was the first Republican governor elected since Reconstruction, and that was Bill Clements. And the only other Republican elected statewide had been Senator John Tower. So I mean, it was, how did we get from there 40 years ago to, to where we are now? Well, there's been a huge shift, obviously. And part of that, you can say, was Richard Nixon's Southern strategy. Uh, I, that, by the way, this, I'm gonna, this is a, little side journey I'm going to take. I enjoy talking to some of the uh, young Democrat officials when they want to talk about civil rights and I remind them that a higher percentage of Republicans in the U.S. Senate voted for the civil rights bill than Democrats. And they just look at me like I'm nuts. But that was when we had the old Southern Democrats and they were anti-civil rights. I remind people that all the people who turned the fire hoses and the dogs loose on the civil rights marchers were Democrat elected officials. Those were not nasty Republicans. But we've changed. So what happened? Well, not those very people, but a lot of that mindset moved over from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party at the behest of, of Richard Nixon. And then in the Ronald Reagan election, uh, a lot more shift occurred. But where I was gonna pick on Mark Jones, if he had been here, is political scientists overlooked to me what was the, the, the major turning event in the Republican Party and in the Democratic Party in the state of Texas. And it was in 1988. It wasn't the fact that George H.W. Bush was elected president. 
It was the fact of who ran against him in the primary. Pat Robertson, the televangelist. So f when I was in the legislature from 1979 to 1987, uh, all the rural areas of Texas and the areas that now we would say are represented largely by the religious right, they all were elected Democrats. And the people in the Texas House with me who sort of carried that banner were for the most part Democrats. Republicans were considered country club Republicans. When I went to the legislature, by the way, there were 24 Republicans and 126 Democrats. Now I became chairman of the House Committee on Energy under that scenario. It wasn't very partisan back then, which is, was a good thing. And I'm gonna say more about that later on because that obviously gets into the whole policy making <coughs> situation. So in 1988, when Pat Robertson ran against George H.W. Bush in the Republican primary for president, his supporters, and this is not critical, it's fact and it was smart on their part, they realized that if you and 10 of your friends go to a precinct convention, you can control that precinct convention. How many of you have ever been to a precinct convention? That's more than I would expect. Almost nobody goes now. But at that time, they went. They then would elect some of their own to go to the senatorial district convention, which is the next level. And then guess what? Since you've done it from the grassroots level, you now have that, then they elected who went to the state convention for the Republican Party. And that's the year, really, that the Republican Party started taking over, started being taken over by a group a different brand of conservative. And I grew up with the Bill Buckley, Howard Baker, Everett Dirksen, even Barry Goldwater. Uh, that, that group isn't considered conservative anymore. And so people don't look to 1988 as much as they should. But prior to that, even though rural, you know, 254 counties in the state of Texas, even though rural counties had voted Republican for president for years and years and years, all of the local elected officials were still Democrats because they all said, we're Democrats, we just don't like our presidential nominee. And that's the way Texas was run and that's what we had. So the shift from Democrats to Republicans in 94 was complete because all those people had joined the Republican Party. There's no way to sugarcoat that. It helped. And everybody in the Republican Party said, ah, oh, that's great. Well, now another shift is occurring. And that is the Republican Party is, is not reaching out to millennials, doesn't seem to be giving a message that appeals to minorities. In fact, I'm going to have a lot more to say about that later. So when's the shift going to occur again? 2022. I will be shocked if Texas doesn't go Democrat in the year 2022. The only thing that might change that would be for the first time we don't, we, this coming election, we won't have straight ticket voting. You don't want me to talk about straight ticket voting. <laughs> and there could be the rise of independence. If the two parties continue to nominate people on the fringe and some independent who's got the resources to run runs for governor, pick, a, pick an office, they could find themselves getting elected. So there is going to be a shift. Now that makes my talk today a little bit difficult. Because I'm supposed to be talking about <clears throat> policy making now and in the future. Well, I can talk about now, but what's the future going to look like? It's going to be a little difficult. So let's start from now. Texas is absolutely booming. Everybody agrees with that. Why? Well, if you ask the current government leaders, they will tell you it's a Texas miracle. That term gets used a lot. It ain't no miracle. It has to do with resources. 
largely natural resources called oil and gas. If we didn't have oil and gas, Texas wouldn't be a miracle, but we do. But we also have people and the, I, I will, I do have a certain Texas pride about me that says, you know, we got a work ethic here that an entrepreneur feeling that people are gonna go out and, and do what needs to be done. And it hadn't always been exactly that way. I mean, look at education in the past. Some things we kind of move slowly in, such as ending segregation in the state of Texas. 50 years ago, you know, I, my high school class was the group that actually saw the, for the first time what were called Negro schools at the time integrated with white schools. Tyler, Texas. If you ask people, they would say there were two high schools in Tyler, Texas, John Tyler and Robert E. Lee. Well, there's actually a third high school called Emmett Scott. Nobody mentioned it. But then integration occurred. And on a total side note, since I played athletics, <clears throat> one of the arguments was always, it's not fair to just throw all those African-American athletes in with these others because they just can't compete. Yeah, that lasted about a year, <laughs> two years maybe, before people went, oh, well, that was bogus. And of course, it applies to intellectual pursuits just as much as it applies to athletics. And so, but it, it took Texas a long time to <clears throat> sort of come around on the people side. So resources is one reason Texas is booming, natural and people. Policies, well, uh, leaders like to brag that we have low taxes and low regulation. And that's true. Is that why we're booming? It helps. And if you want to discuss ancient history, one of the key decisions made <clears throat> was in the 1930s. Uh, the Railroad Commission of Texas, which was formed to regulate railroads, was given the power to regulate the oil and gas industry. And it is what, if you followed the development of the East Texas oil field, <clears throat> if we hadn't put in pro-rationing of oil production, then the price of oil would have plummeted and we wouldn't have gotten rich. But the Railroad Commission of Texas found a way to, for the sake of conserving natural resources, keep the price of oil up. And that's what gave Texas a lot of money. It's what created the Permanent University Fund, all kinds of things like that. <clears throat> that was a great regulatory decision that was made. But we haven't always been fast. I don't know how many of you remember when that same Railroad Commission of Texas wouldn't allow United Parcel Service, UPS, to operate point to point within the state of Texas. And I mention that to people today and they go, what are you talking about? Well, in the late 70s, early 80s, when UPS was really coming on stream, <clears throat> if you wanted to ship a package from Midland, Texas to Houston, Texas, you couldn't use UPS. They were not allowed to go point to point because the Railroad Commission of Texas had regulations in place that said you had to operate under a certificate of convenience and necessity which meant basically you had to operate the same route, same schedule all the time. Well, UPS doesn't do like that. It took us four or five legislative sessions to finally overturn that, and it wasn't ultimately overturned until I went to Washington, where the Interstate Commerce Commission had control, and we could say, well, no, it's actually interstate commerce, you can't interfere with it. But had that decision not been changed, all the distribution centers were gonna locate outside the state of Texas because it was easier to ship from Houston to Shreveport and back in than it was point to point. Now that's an obscure thing that not many of you, some of you are out there nodding, so it makes me wonder what industry you're in. But, <laughs> but the rest of the world went, we didn't know anything about that. But if that decision hadn't been made, then we wouldn't be a distribution center and we wouldn't be a logistics hub today. So yes, we have low taxes, and for the most part, 
we have few regulations. But that example I gave you is one that uh, obviously could have enhanced us. Wise investments. Texas has made wise investments over the years. I remember growing up, we'd go on family vacation and my dad would always talk about how much better Texas highways were than highways in other states. He was so proud of that. And our universities, you know, the Permanent University Fund and everything that allowed the University of Texas and Texas A&M. It's good to be at Rice, not a single whoop came out. <laughs> I'm so used to just stopping and listening for a whoop. <laughs> but we also had a, a, a lot of help because we had a congressional delegation that pulled down federal dollars like crazy. I mean, NASA wasn't located here because NASA just thought, well, what a fine place to go. No, there was this guy called Lyndon Baines Johnson who, who forced that to happen. But think of all the military installations that we've had in Texas over the years. And of course, the interstate highway system, we're just big. So we had a lot of investment in that from the federal government. We actually sought out federal participation. I'll get back to whether we do that so much now, or whether we wake up every morning and sue the federal government. <laughs> that I sort of tipped my hand already. And then finally, our location. Uh, the weather, okay, air conditioning helped a lot. <laughs> we can't, can't get around that. If it hadn't been for air conditioning, we would not be the growing state that we are. But we're also perfectly located in a, in a globalization scenario. Because if you look at a map of North America, we're centrally located. So we can be an economic engine and the ports where we're here. And the Port of Houston, of course, uh, one of the largest ports in the world. Think about it today. If somebody, if, the, if we didn't have the Port of Houston and some official said, you know what, we're gonna dig a 52 mile ditch <coughs> and make Houston a port, it would never happen. <laughs> From an environmental point of view, all kind, it just wouldn't happen. But it did happen, the timing was perfect because then you had the spindle top in the East Texas oil field. <clears throat> so Texas is booming, but is it a miracle? No. It's because of some decisions that were made and some uh, sitting on top of natural resources. So that's how we got to now. Those resources, though, were beginning to deplete. And then fracking came along. And there's no way to get around the fact that the, the latest oil and gas boom, where the United States is now a net exporter of oil. I mean, all of us remember the 1970s when everything was so dire and uh, you know, the Arab oil embargo and we were all suffering and uh, we had 55 mile an hour speed limits. Think about that. Bumper strips that said drive, drive fast and freeze a Yankee or something. I, I forget exactly what they said, but you know, they weren't particularly cute, but they were noteworthy. Then fracking comes along. So now we're in that exporter and it's not just oil, it's also natural gas because now we have the feedstock for all the plastic pellets and things like that. So suddenly we're, we're able to do things that we weren't able to do all because of fracking and George Mitchell and people like that. And, and is that a miracle? No, we're just darn lucky that it happened and, and we're the ones that get to benefit from it. That's a good thing. Education and workforce development. That's not such a good thing. It's slipping in both areas. There is, and I'm gonna have a lot more to say about that later on. But how many of you went to public high school, public schools? <clears throat> I rest my case. Uh, 
you know, there are actually people. Lieutenant Governor Patrick, one of his education advisors a few years ago, resigned after saying that, well, public education is just a socialist plot. We had a woman run for State Board of Education who almost won without a runoff. And, and had she won the Republican primary, she would be on the State Board of Education, who the only reason she finally lost was people started looking at her Facebook page where she was espousing theories about why the dinosaurs are extinct because they didn't have the right pair on Noah's Ark. <clears throat> And you have a lot of people in the education, not in the education community, who are trying to influence the education community, who sincerely believe that the earth is less than 10,000 years old. And that's become part of the political rhetoric. Sorry. How can we be the oil and gas <laughs> and believe that? I don't get it. It, it defies logic. And then what are we doing to develop the workforce? That's going to be a key, key question. One of the worst decisions made by the Texas legislature and other leaders was basically to do away with uh, training in, in various industrial arts. Uh, instead, we wanted everybody to go to college. By the way, I did come to Rice on a rowing scholarship. <laughs> if you don't get that, somebody else will explain it to you. Uh, $500,000 to go to USC? Really? I don't get that. I, and I, I actually had a, a friend who went to USC and said, I'd have given them my place for half of that. <laughs> I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense. So, <clears throat> so anyway. Uh, but education and workforce development, what are we putting on education? Uh, talk more about it later, but in order to put education in the proper framework, I tell people, drive across Texas. Look at the water tower in small towns. It will tell you the last time that school went to the state semifinals in football or basketball. It will never tell you how many national merit finalists they have. Go to the cafe. They can tell you the name of the quarterback, but they probably can't tell you the name of the valedictorian. That's, that's all you need to know. And I'm, I'm not, I love athletics, but still, what's our focus? More about that later. So education workforce development is slipping. Infrastructure investment, where are we now? Well, it's sketchy. Gasoline tax hadn't been raised since 1992. And it was a flat rate. Inflation has occurred since 1992. It was an index to, to inflation, unfortunately. And cars have gotten a lot more fuel efficient. And electric vehicles don't pay anything. So our investment uh, in infrastructure, not just transportation, but other things. And then, oh, by the way, we used to say toll roads were going to be an answer. But now the same people who don't like high gas taxes don't like toll roads either. So the assumption must be that there's a highway ferry that's going to come down and say, here's your road. you got to pay for it somehow. And it's not just roads. It's schools. It's flood mitigation. It's anything that you want to invest in. It's going to take money. And I don't see that. The partisanship that I mentioned earlier, uh, that's different from 50 years ago. Uh, this very weekend, uh, you know, the, the, I could spend a long time talking about property taxes. But the truth of the matter is, the state government is trying to impose on local governments what they can and cannot do. And if they succeed at that by putting a 2.5% revenue cap on property taxes, then that's going to be a serious problem. Uh, and I say that as a local official, and I would defend the people who are now taking my place. They have the right to make some decisions. States shouldn't be interfering with that. 
So it, it's that effort that's going to cause a problem. And of course, the politicians are all proclaiming a Texas miracle. Uh, and I had to chuckle watching the ads. And you're going to think I'm going to pick on Dan Patrick a lot today, and I am. Uh, <laughs> You know, you had an ad, I'm not going to let Texas become California. But in fact, what two issues matter the most to him? Property tax, relief. Remember Howard Jarvis? Remember Prop 13 in California? Where'd that get them? State of Colorado had the Taxpayer Bill of Rights right until it started bankrupting them and they had to go back and repeal it. So it sounds good. But you gotta pay for pay for things with something. I'm not a big high tax person, but you gotta make make those decisions. And the other is, you know, a harsh rhetoric about immigration. Pete Wilson tried that when he was governor of California. So it's ironic to me that that Lieutenant Governor Patrick doesn't want us to be California, but he's pursuing the exact two issues that made California what it is today. So that's where we are now in that regard. What we really have, I think, and it's not unique to, that's why I said it, it's going to sound like I'm being very harsh to my own party, and I am, but it, it could apply equally to the other side if they were in power. They're just not. We have people clinging desperately to power, and like this weekend, there's great arm twisting going on over Senate Bill 2, which is the property tax bill. And there's now a threat. The Senate has a rule that it takes 60% vote to bring a bill to the floor because that was the normal gen. It used to be two thirds, but when Lieutenant Governor Patrick figured out that 19 is 60 and not two thirds, then they lowered it to 60. And so that slows the process and it makes decisions more deliberative in policy making. But if you don't get what you want, and you say, I'm going to throw it out, well, guess what? If he throws it out now, in 2023, if the Democrats have taken control, then they're going to say, well, we don't have to go through that slow process. You didn't do it. And where's the model for that come from? The national level. Chuck Schumer thought it was a brilliant idea to do away with that. It never crossed his mind that someday he wouldn't be in control. Now he's complaining that Mitch McConnell is abusing the system. And Mitch is going, no, I'm just doing what you did those many years ago. So you need to be careful about policy making because if you live long enough, you see the ebbs and flows of who's in charge of politics. And so if the rules are good for one, they, they better be good for the other. So the question we have to ask, is there a vision for the future of Texas? either a holistic vision or even vision that goes issue by issue. Defending the status quo is not a vision. There's no way, it's not. So the Republicans that are in charge right now are trying to defend the status quo and say, we're Texas, we're wonderful, everybody loves us, we're better than everybody else, but you know, sooner or later the New England Patriots won't keep winning. I mean, it, these things just change. So you can't just sit on what, what you have. At the same time, I don't see the Democrats offering a vision other than they're not the Republicans and they don't like Trump. And that's a whole separate subject that's not in my portfolio today, so we'll leave that one. So right now, to answer the question, policy making in Texas, is it inspired or depressing? It's depressing. Sorry. I, I, I can't come to any other conclusion. <clears throat> there are issues, though, that need inspired policymaking, no matter who is in office. And so I've got six of them I want to talk about. <clears throat> education. Public education is so different today than it was, I'm making an assumption about most of your ages, but than it was when we were in public school. 
there were very few church schools, and those have risen. Private schools, uh, I knew about them, but they weren't things that I dealt with much. Homeschool, no. It, it just, I didn't know anybody that, that homeschooled. And yet, I'm not able to do it, but I was invited to, to be the speaker at the homeschool commencement ceremony this year. <laughs> you don't think about that. And now homeschoolers are trying to find a way to get into extracurricular activities uh, with the public schools. And I'm going, this is really weird. Uh, but it's, it's different. And you can say you like it, you don't like it, but it doesn't matter. The world has changed. So somebody has to jump up and start talking about, why do we still have K through 12? Why, why do students have to stay in a certain grade by age if in some course they could be two grades ahead? Pre-K. Everybody agrees putting money into pre-K would be one of the best investments we could possibly make. Why isn't it happening? Governor said he wants it. Other people said they want it. But it's not happening. Uh, public education's got to become a focus. Higher education. Uh, got the University of Texas, you got Texas A&M. But what about all those other schools? I mean, if, is it now time to start really focusing on maybe expanding a little bit more? We talk about how bad California is, but maybe some of their model might be more useful if we talk about the way we do state universities. Uh, and then workforce. <clears throat> and you cannot talk about the workforce of Texas without talking about immigration. I mean, <clears throat> I live in West University. I go for regular walks with Bird Ballenfont, who's back there in the back. Uh, and I see the people who are working on those homes. And are they all in this country legally? No. I will tell you, when I, I was out of politics. I had no interest in being back in politics. In 2007, when Commissioner's Court appointed me, I went, OK, I'll do this for a little while public service kind of thing. And one of the first meetings I went to was a group that was so anti-immigration. And this guy stood up and was talking about all the illegal immigration that's occurring in the state of Texas. And I made light of it. I didn't realize they were that serious. And I, and I stood up and I went, wait a minute, I'm a native Texan. I'm shocked. You're telling me people are coming to Texas illegally from across the Mexican border? Really? And they didn't take that well. <laughs> But we grew up, that was part of our economy, and it is still part of our economy. And if we don't figure a way um, to make that system work and to educate in a way that the, the, the kids who are in public schools can be trained to do well-paying jobs, then we're going to be in a world of hurt. And we, we've got to make that happen because to finish education, go back to those public schools, they are overwhelmingly minority in the urban areas. Because anybody that can, unless you live in a specific zone where the public schools are great, they've gone to the suburbs. And as I tell people about transportation all the time, people do not move to Sci Fair for the joy of commuting. They move out there for the schools and you get more home. And the same applies to Katy or Humble or anywhere else. And it's leaving the urban school districts just totally non-representative of, of the general public. And once in a while, my conservative bent comes out here on campus when somebody wants to talk about how bad we are. And I say, well, wait a minute. I moved to Washington, D.C. in 1989. I thought I'd put my kids in the public schools at Woodrow Wilson High School. It's a gorgeous school. Uh, Northwest D.C., it's a fine area. Lots of wealthy people live there. And I went, and the counselor was thrilled to see me, and, and she said, we're so glad you're here, and we're so proud of our school because you know we have the National Merit Finalists this year for D.C. And I went, you have the what? The? 
Bel Air High School had 43. And why? Well, because in Washington, D.C., the same thing happens. Woodrow Wilson High School does not at all reflect the community that lives around it because they put their kids in Sidwell Friends and, and all these others. Uh, it, it is what it is. So education, I'm, I've spent more time talking about it than I really should because I'm not an expert on it, <clears throat> but it's the key. We've got to get the answer to that. Taxes and investments, property tax. Everybody who runs for office says, elect me, I'm gonna lower your property tax. Most of them are state officials. State doesn't have a property tax. So they say, elect me and I'm gonna make somebody else lower your property tax. <laughs> and usually it's the counties. And two years ago, they came up with the goofiest scheme I have ever seen. It was to limit property tax revenue of all counties, all 254 counties. Now, Loving County has 90 people, and Harris County has 4.7 million people, so clearly we ought to be treated the same. Uh, it would limit all of us to population growth of the state plus inflation. Well, if the state grows 1%, Harris County's grown 10, Collin County's grown 40. It made no sense. And when I talked to the governor about it, he said, I know. I said, well, what are you gonna do? Yeah, but that's what people want. They want lower property taxes. Well, if we're gonna lower property taxes, we've gotta find a way to do it that makes some sense, that doesn't hamstring <coughs> proper investment. And oh, by the way, uh, appraisal caps, everybody's proud of those because nobody likes the fact that your property keeps going up and up and up, and that way we politicians could keep the tax rate the same and your property taxes still go up because of the inflation of your property. So they put a property, uh, uh, an appraisal cap of 10%. <clears throat> it's in the Constitution, you can't change it. But you know how unfair that is? I live in West U. Every year my home has gone up more than 10%, so the assessed value is held down to where I'm, I don't know the exact number, but I'm probably paying property taxes on 80% of the true value of my home. Somebody who lives in Sunnyside and owns a home where the values haven't gone up 10%, they're still paying on 100% of the value of their home. So why is it fair for me in a fast growing area to, to get a break like that? It's not, but nobody wants to talk about it because we all want to lower property taxes. Well, you can't keep doing that and continue funding transportation uh, without even thinking about what are we going to do for rail. We're not, we're not going to build any more rings around the city of Houston. The next ring would be closer to San Antonio than it would be to Houston. <laughs> I mean, we just can't. So there's got to be some discussion of, of what we're going to invest. And then how do you approach economic development, new technology, all those things, if your constant mantra is, we're gonna lower your property tax. They're gonna to have to do something. And by the way, gasoline tax I mentioned earlier, you know the state of Alabama last month raised their gasoline tax? Now if the state of Alabama can do it, surely we ought to be able to look at how we're funding things. So number one was education, number two, taxes, investment. Because if we don't invest in things, what if we hadn't invested in the Houston Chip Channel? You know, you got to look back and say, we made investments, they were wise. We got to make them for the future. Resilience. <clears throat> if we don't do something about flooding, we got a problem. Because the image that the world saw, and trust me, I kind of had some firsthand experience with it, the image that the world saw was <clears throat> Houston's flooding. And the Associated Press had an article a couple of weeks ago that almost got in, it showed up very briefly on cron.com and I went through the ceiling because it, it said that here are the cities that might not exist in 2100. Did you happen to see it? Fortunately, it went away pretty quick because I called some people. <laughs> <laughs> in it, Miami, fine, let Miami go. <coughs> New Orleans, which is already below sea level. But number three was Houston. 
And in the article it said, Houston is going to continue sinking. Now, never mind that we're already 50 feet or so above sea level. We're, we're not quite in the same category with Miami or New Orleans. But it said we're sinking because we're pumping groundwater. We quit pumping groundwater decades ago. We have the subsidence district. You're prohibited from pumping groundwater. And yet that article, maybe it got pulled here, but it probably went around the world. And so people are now looking at it and say, well, we don't want to invest in Houston. We don't want to go there. They're going to sink into the Gulf of Mexico. So we've got to invest in, in flood mitigation, but not just flood mitigation. Parts of Texas, we need to invest in water supply. We have to have a vision of, of what do we want to look at. We got too much water, they got too little water. How do we make that work? And I can't talk about resilience without talking about the rainy day fund. <clears throat> it's actually called the Economic Stabilization Fund for the state of Texas. And two years ago, when Joe Strauss, the speaker, and, and others in the Texas House decided well, we've got nine or $10 billion in there. Why don't we take some of that money and invest it in education? The senators said, oh, no, 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 no. We need to save that for a rainy day. Well, if Harvey wasn't a rainy day, <laughs> then I don't know what is. But did they invest it? Did they come to our aid with it? No. So there has to be a rainy day fund, and it, but it has to be used. You can't just sit on it and think, I don't know what they think. And one way to use it would be for the local match, not for areas like ours. But take a county like Chambers County or Liberty County. They don't have the resources. And so in order to draw down the federal dollars quickly, you have to come up with the 10 or 20 or whatever the match is. Why would other states, they invest it. The other states say, county's an arm of, of state government we will provide the local match. It's a perfect use for the rainy day fund. Anyway, so resilience is number three. Number four is health care. <clears throat> if you look at your Harris County property tax bill, over a quarter of it goes straight to the Harris County Hospital District for indigent health care. All of that is paid for by your property tax. When I went to Austin and suggested Medicaid expansion, you would have thought that I had just rolled a stink bomb in the room. They didn't even want to talk about it. But then I went back to some of the Tea Party groups and I said, look, this isn't about who gets treated. We got the same number of poor people regardless. It's a question of who's gonna pay for it. Either your property taxes or Medicaid. And by the way, last time I checked, I think we pay into that. So those are some of our funds. So whether we do Medicaid expansion or not, the state's gonna have to come up with a better way of funding indigent healthcare. And if you're talking about healthcare, then we have to talk about other issues of public health. The state of Texas is, in my opinion, a total embarrassment when it comes to immunization. We have some of the highest percentage of kids who are not immunized uh, because, if you remember, there was a doctor in the U UK who had a study that showed that uh, childhood immunizations caused autism. It was totally debunked. He lost his ability to practice medicine in the UK. And where did he move? To Texas. And so the legislature is totally afraid to do anything on immunization, and it's a ticking time bomb. If you want a speaker, get Dr. Peter Hotez out here to talk to you. He will scare you to death, but don't bring him during lunch. He talks about things that really aren't uh, <laughs> really good. So public health is gonna, it, it's got to, somebody's gotta come up with a vision of what we wanna be with public health. And you can't talk about healthcare without talking about that one issue that is in my mind, ruined politics, and that's abortion. The two parties have just taken these extreme positions. I've polled on that issue for years and years and years. 20% of the people think there should be no abortions. These are rough numbers. 
20% of the people say it's nobody's business but the woman and her doctor. And the other 60 are kind of out here in the middle. You know, they want to talk about partial birth or this, that, and the other. But when I say it's ruined politics, people running for sheriff have to answer questions about what their view of abortion is. It's not their job. When I was first named county judge, I was given this questionnaire and I said, county judge doesn't have anything to do with that. I'm not gonna answer your questionnaire. They said, well, but you have opinions. I said, yeah, but it doesn't have anything to do with my job. So if we keep electing people to jobs based on their view on abortion, I don't care which party you're in, it's just wrong. Democrats do it on one side, Republicans do it on the other side. And so we got to separate that from this whole sort of health care discussion. But health care is number four. Number five is environment. <clears throat> Climate change is happening. Why people can't say that is beyond me. I mean, subsidence I mentioned earlier. It happened. We found a solution. We know for a fact, uh, I mean, people used to trust NASA. So if you saw photos from space that showed that the ice caps are melting, you said, wow, look at that. Now we say fake news. It's not really true. Rush Limbaugh says that's not true. So therefore, it's not happening. Go to Glacier National Park. You can see where the glaciers were and where they are now. Yeah, I don't even know why that's a debate. Now, the debate ought to be what's the cause and what are we going to do about it? But to just continue to deny that it exists, so that's one piece. But then we also get into the whole question of clean air and water. Uh, we have things that are impacting our environment. And does the state of Texas have a policy? Do they have a vision? And I think we saw a great example of that when the ITC plume appeared. You think I'm going to pick on my successor, and I'm not. We were driving in from East Texas where we have a cabin. I see this giant plume across there. And I went, wow, what is that? It's what everybody asked, right? So the first press conference wasn't until 27 hours after the fire. The state of Texas wasn't there. And while the local officials said, well, it's way up there and it's not going to impact us, it's going to come down somewhere. I mean, some poor rancher in Brady, Texas is going to have boils on his arms and go, <laughs> why'd this happen? So, but the state was just nowhere. Uh, the state's got to be serious. I, I know we all want to support industry. I agree with that. But at the same time, Industry will be the first to tell you if something bad happens, they want to deal with it. They don't want to just ignore it. So do we have an environmental policy in the state of Texas? I think the answer is no. And finally, overriding all of this <clears throat> is the question of governance. And I gotta be real quick because I want to leave 10 minutes here. <clears throat> we hate to admit it, but Texas is an urban state. Think about it. Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, very soon Austin. These are top 10 cities in the country in terms of population. It's where people live. So we have to have policies that recognize that. And there has to be a focus on Houston and our area. Now that I'm at the Kinder Institute for Urban Research, one, I can tell you one of my pet projects is gonna be, what are we gonna do? Harris County has 4.7 million people in it. Less than half of those people live inside the city of Houston. That's not the bad part. The bad part is almost two million live in unincorporated Harris County, where there's no city government, there's no ordinances, nothing. And the way the policy has developed over the years, annexation won't occur in the future. I could give you the long, gory detail, but we are unique. And it goes back to 1963 when the city of Houston did strip annexations 
put everything into the extraterritorial jurisdiction of the city so that they could not incorporate, nor could cities like Tomball, Lumbel, Baytown, and Katy encroach into the ETJ. So it just left all that in limbo, and that's where all the new subdivisions got built using municipal utility districts as their model. That's a long, I could, I could do a class on that, may do that one day. But we have to figure out how are we gonna develop as an urban area with that situation. Doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. So when we talk about whether urban mobility or any other urban issue, we're gonna to have to come up with some answers about what our urban areas are going to look like. And right now, we don't have it. We still have people saying all counties ought to be treated the same. So we've got to start, and, and we've, we've got to get over this idea that the state is against the cities. And that has come, that's been a real loud argument going on. And politically, do I like what's going on in Austin? No. But, if you ask people where's one of your favorite cities in America, they'll say Austin. So who am I as an old guy to say to young people, that's not the way you ought to be running your city. I mean, in fact, Austin's booming for a reason. Now they made some horrible decisions about transportation and I-35 is now the largest parking lot in America any time of day. But you know, the state needs to decide we're gonna work with cities rather than against cities. So having said all that, and not knowing which party is gonna be in control of which offices, uh, I think right now it's policy making in Texas is somewhat depressing, uh, but I think we have a chance. And, and I think those issues have to be addressed. And if we do it right, Texas will continue to, to boom. It won't be a miracle in the 50 years from now any more than it's a miracle now. But we have to overcome this anti-intellectual bent that we seem to have right now in politics. And we have to regain a respect for and almost an awe for science and education. And of course, you being here means you put great value on education and continuing education. So that's a little bit of a fast track through uh, what I think about policy making in the state of Texas. And I think I've got 10 minutes to answered questions. Now, uh, while I tell people here all the time that I am now here at Rice, I'm happy here at Rice, I love what I'm doing, I'm not a politician in exile, I still have some political bent. So that means you can ask whatever question you want, but I'm probably gonna answer the one that I wanted you to ask. <laughs> Just like occurs in presidential debates. They always say, that's a great question, but what we really need to talk about is, so if I do that to you, just drag me back. I'm, I'm trying to get over my bad habits. Who's first? Come on, don't be shy. Yes, sir. So, uh, so a lot of the ideas that the allies have with the initial president and the court going forward, uh, I think could some of that, the data you're talking about, the information, can come from a place like Rice or from Richard. <coughs> The question is, a place like Rice obviously uh, has the ability to generate data and some good ideas, and, and would the state leaders be receptive? Uh, some of the current state leaders aren't. There's no way around it. Uh, if you haven't picked, on, picked up on it, I'm not a big fan of our lieutenant governor. Uh, but I think Elections have interesting uh, effects. And so what we're beginning to see, a lot of people who thought they were in very safe districts and they didn't have to consider different points of view got squeaked by with 50.5 and 51%. And suddenly they're going, well, you know what? Uh, maybe we ought to be open to ideas. But I really do think it gets back more to, uh, and I hate to pick on talk radio and other things, but there is this anti-intellectual bent out there in politics right now, 
particularly in the Republican Party, I don't mind saying it, where, well, we don't, we don't care what some professor thinks. And, and we got to get over that because, uh, you know, I grew up in the East Texas oil field and was the first member of my family to get a college degree. And everybody was real proud of that. We got to get back to that feeling. Yes, ma'am. What's the best way for the centrist to get back in the game? Go vote in the primary. Plain and simple. If we could get back to the day, and I don't care which primary you vote in, but if, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, when Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst was in his runoff with Ted Cruz, I suggest that, look, what you've got to do is get November Republicans to come vote in a primary. You, but both parties, they keep wanting to go to their base, whatever the base is, when in fact they ought to be trying to bring people into the primary. Uh, and I think this last election cycle may help in that uh, because people are now beginning to say, oh, if you're a Democrat, we, we need to nominate people that really know what they're doing. And likewise on Republican, I mentioned the woman that almost got the nomination for the State Board of Education. Uh, the only way is to get people back in the primaries or we're gonna end up with this independent, which could happen in my mind. Yes, sir. Metronext 2040, do you think we will change? I'm sorry? Metronext, the, the, their, 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 their plans and their $7 billion plans are kind of rolling out. Yeah, what about it? Um, the, the question on this is Metronext 2040, uh, what do I think about Metro's plan? You know, it's, it's like everything else, it's got some good and some bad, but what we can't do is go back to, to old technology, and I, I'm, I'm going to pick on people. Think of some of the bad decisions that have been made. There was a time when TxDOT owned the rail line from Katy to downtown. They offered it to Metro, and Metro said, we don't want it. We wouldn't have to have an 84-lane freeway uh, if we had. I mean, I could even make money running a train from Katy to downtown and back, like the Virginia Railway Express. But using rail technology in today's world probably isn't the best approach to take. I mean, uh, think of the Uber situation we have right now. I mean, would we be better off giving people vouchers and letting them go where they were. We don't have, while we've got downtown Houston, we've got the Energy Corridor, we've got Galleria, we've got the Woodlands, and who knows what's gonna happen if Chevron and Anadarko, are they gonna be downtown or are they gonna be in the Woodlands? So once you start putting in fixed things, it makes it more difficult. So as much flexibility as Metro can put in, I think the better it'll be. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Well, wow, what immigration policy? You know, there's gonna be a little bit of a wandering answer, but, but I have to get something off my chest. Uh, I heard a talk show host one time <clears throat> say that his relatives had all come into this country legally through Ellis Island. Well, when Ellis Island was in operation, there weren't immigration quotas. I mean, you got here, you got to come in. Having a southern border the way we do uh, makes it a little different. But the truth of the matter is, if our quotas were just larger, they wouldn't be illegal. So everybody, even Ronald Reagan, remember, said there's got to be some kind of a path to, if not citizenship, residency. Uh, you, you, you can't have people just living in the shadows. And the fact that nobody wants to solve it, and, and they had it, they just didn't do it. So we've, we've got to get to that sooner or later. Uh, 
I, I do not, and I don't think I'm naive, I do not think most of these people are coming here to harm Americans. They're, they're coming here for the reasons that this is where the jobs are, and this is the better place for their children to be raised. And yes, there are bad things going on in Central America, uh, but we just have to make some kind of a path so that people, when they get here, uh, aren't just hidden in the shadows. And by the way, one other thing. Right after I became county judge, this immigration issue, as I said, boiled up. And I was told one of the, by a consultant, <clears throat> one of the first things you need to do is say that no county services are gonna go to an illegal. And I said, well, let me think about that. So I went and talked to Dr. Palacio, who was my public health director at the time. She was about this tall and she scared me to death. Uh, she said, well, the problem is you can't do that because the Harris County Hospital District, uh, federal law says anybody who shows up at an emergency room has to be treated. Doctors take an oath to treat people. And oh, by the way, unless you want a pandemic to break out in your community, you really ought to be in favor. So we did the exact opposite of what the consultant said. Instead, we started going to the neighborhood clinics and trying to do primary care and preventive care as much as possible. And, and I think that was by far you know, the, the right thing to do. Uh, and so then people started saying, well, but those people don't pay taxes. In the state of Texas, unless you're talking about a franchise tax, anybody who is here pays the same taxes as anybody else, whether they're legal or not. They pay sales tax, and through their rent, they pay property tax. That's all you got. We don't have an income tax, and many of those people, in fact, are paying Social Security tax that they're probably never gonna see uh, for all kinds of other reasons. So I, I, just, I just think we ought to get over the harsh rhetoric and, and start finding a solution. So. That may have been the last one, unless somebody's got some real pithy uh, last question. Thank you all very much, appreciate it.